Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kyung Shin Moon of Korea Institute of Toxicology. Today, I will be uh, talking about IC8 guideline S6 and uh, its addendum. And so it's about 2 o'clock. So this must be the most difficult time uh, in a day and to listen and it's quite difficult to listen to the the uh, guidelines it's very difficult i understand how tiring uh, it must be for you and how difficult it is to concentrate and all in my presentation i don't have uh, the figures or the graphs to show and they are mainly uh, texts and so and uh, if you've been in this uh, business, if you know uh, the contents, you may be able to have better understanding. If not, uh, you would have quite difficult time uh, understanding uh, the uh, the presentation. And so this could be a, a quite a painstaking time uh, for some of you, but this is an important information when it comes to pharmaceutical development. So I do hope that you will uh, concentrate uh, uh, despite the fact that it's going to be very difficult. So we're going to, I'm going to be dealing with the, the basics. And, uh, and I think that we can make use of the Q&A time to deal with more uh, detailed uh, aspects. And this S6 uh, guideline was issued back in uh, uh, 1997. And Biotechnology derived uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, and so pre uh, preclinical uh, safety evaluation of the biotechnology derived pharmaceuticals is what uh, this uh, guideline or guidance uh, focuses on, and so uh, the scope is uh, is narrower than biologics. So here, when we talk about so we talk about the biologics or the vaccines or the uh, recombinant uh, product or the cell uh, therapies, but those are the uh, biomedical products. So that's the however what we're dealing with in with this guideline is uh, about recombinant uh, products and uh, other uh, products are dealt with in this guideline uh, or guidance. So this has a narrower scope than uh, biomedical uh, product uh, scope. And then back in uh, 2012, there was an addendum that was uh, published. And in the addendum, the well, uh, the S6 deals with the uh, general issues, and so uh, then them provides additional information about the proper uh, about the selection of the animal species, and also uh, more uh, specific uh, information in regards to uh, bio uh, medical products are uh, included in the addendum and that's what we'll be uh, looking at uh, this time. So uh, so I'm going to be talking about the biopharmaceutical products or biomedical products. Well, I will be just referring to them as product. And so this uh, pre-clinical uh, safety assessment of such a product is uh, has to is a case-by-case -case incentive-based approach. And so, so existing toxicological assessment uh, may not be able to, uh, may not be applicable. So in terms of the design, in terms of the structures, and also uh, there are diff many different uh, types of the product. And so we cannot uh, apply the toxicology uh, evaluation uh, for the chemical product. So this has to be a case by case. It has to be because uh, there has to be science based approach when we are doing this a uh, preclinical safety evaluation for these sort of products. But it's not uh, easy to apply them. And the MFDS and also uh, the the labs that do the testing or the evaluation. And uh, most of us, we if it's not a uh, innovative biological uh, product, then you know existing uh, big farmers or the large uh, foreign uh, pharma companies, you know if uh, if they, they have if they have already developed, then we would simply have been following them, and uh, and you would also have to follow the documentation, and so uh, this is as I said, it's a flexible case by case science based approach uh, that is required for the uh, evaluation, and and however you do need to have 
have uh, references, you do need to have the data uh, based on which you can do your own uh, preclinical uh, safety evaluation. And the ultimate goal of such an evaluation, as was mentioned by our previous uh, speaker, is to uh, to be able to uh, know the scheme, uh, to develop the schemes uh, related to a uh, dose selection as a dose ranging. And also uh, when doing the clinical uh, test, uh, there could be unexpected uh, toxicology related uh, pl problems as so how to identify them. And in order to be able to identify, and you also need to be able to tie uh, uh, to uh, identify the, the target organs. And they also, uh, you need to know where those uh, target uh, toxicity is reversible or non-reversible. And also uh, there are some uh, uh, parameters that are specific to the biopharmaceutical products, not just uh, toxicology, but also the, the PDs. And so whether those sort of uh, biomarkers can be uh, applicable, well, it's quite important. So those, you know, so identifying these safety uh, parameters is a very important part of the uh, preclinical uh, safety testing. And uh, the scope is the products uh, derived from characterized cells through expression systems, including bacteria, yeast, insect, plant, and uh, mammalian uh, cells. So that uh, to how we could define the scope. And the protein uh, product and peptides. And uh, the recombinant a DNA uh, technology-based products or transgenic uh, plants and animals or uh, the product from a uh, transgenic plant and animals. So those are uh, the type of products that will be included in the scope. And the cytokines or the plasma uh, and the plasminogen activator or the recombinant plasma uh, factors, growth factors, the fusion proteins, the are, uh, as you can see, uh, real, uh, or excuse me, or the uh, protein related uh, fact of so, oh, excuse me enzymes and hormones uh, they are always included in the scope so protein vaccines or the plasma derived products or the uh, endogenous uh, proteins and oligonucleotide uh, of drugs and those uh, drugs can also be defined as the products that are included in the scope of this particular guideline that we are uh, looking at. And when doing the preclinical uh, safety testing, what's really important is the test materials, in particular their quality. And uh, these uh, test materials could, should be, are uh, derived from cells and viruses. And so there could be host of derived uh, contaminants or impurities. And those uh, contaminants or the impurities need to be characterized. And because they are from the hosts, and there could be uh, vDNAs or uh, RNAs, and if they do exist, they need to be uh, removed because if they are injected, they could potentially be inserted into human DNA and that could cause problems. And and so in non uh, so in, in preclinical safety testing, you should be able to identify them. And if from an animal uh, derived or the cell uh, derived or animal produced uh, test materials, uh, they would have I mean, animal derived uh, viruses. And so these sort of uh, contaminants uh, need to be controlled as part of the test materials. However, uh, when you do a preclinical pre -clinical test, you would have the COS in order to prove that there are no such problems. However, unlike the chemical uh, products, the biological products or biopharmaceutical products, uh, I mean, we do need to check our stability. And so when, uh, so uh, it's uh, not easy to secure enough time. So if you are, if you do, uh, the, the COA is uh, produced uh, without, you know, given a sufficient time. As a result, uh, there are uh, cases when impurities are uh, identified if the COA has been issued. And so uh, the control of the test material is essential. It's very critical. Uh, personally, I feel that uh, the test control, so uh, when you, the importance, uh, if you, uh, like a test material control like, is like a 50 percent it takes up the 50 percent importance in, in all the preclinical safety testing and and the test materials are for the clinical test and the test materials for the preclinical test they need to be equal 
Well, some say uh, they are different, but you have to do a uh, comparability testing in order to do to prove uh, their equivalence. Well, chemical products are uh, relatively easy, but when it comes to biologics, it's not easy to pr prove uh, the equivalence. And it's not just the product, but you have to think about the the culturing conditions as well as the production conditions, and also when on the, it's at scale, uh, the conditions do change, and and they. Uh, make it difficult to maintain equivalence. And so when you're planning for a preclinical uh, testing or assessment, uh, you have to uh, utilize a GMP or a GMP equivalent uh, facilities. And that would ensure uh, that you do not have uh, problems later on. And uh, there are some considerations when doing a preclinical uh, testing. And and the thing that you must consider the most is uh, the selection of the relevant animal as species. It's not just the species that you have to consider. You have to think about the age of the animals and also the physiological state of the disease and also uh, the manner of delivery. You know, what sort of dosage, what sort of out of way, what sort of treatment regimen uh, will be employed are also quite important. I've done a lot of testing uh, with biological or the biopharmaceutical products, and I've seen these sort of uh, variables. And all these uh, variables need to be considered. And in particular, the most important thing is selecting the right animal species and also preparing the uh, test materials in line with that uh, species. And also uh, with the uh, toxicity testing, this has to be done in compliance with the GLPs. And the uh, toxicity testing, especially uh, the animal testing, it's easy to follow the GLPs. However, uh, these uh, biologics, or there, uh, uh, there, if uh, uh, there are times when the deval uh, new evaluation parameters have to be used, and, uh, and so there may be cases when it's difficult to comply with the GLPs, especially, especially when it comes to analysis. Uh, as I said, uh, you need to follow the GLP, but uh, in order to do G uh, GLP, you have the SOP, you have the protocol, you have to have the guidances. And uh, in the SOP, it does not talk about specific analysis method, and it's not really a uh, GLP compliant, but, but that does not mean that we cannot do the testing. However, we have to do the testing as much close as possible to the uh, GLP uh, compliance. And so, but however, you do know what's not in compliance with the GLP, so you do the testing. And you also should be able to assess the, uh, that impact on the overall testing. And, and that has to be recorded in the toxicology report. So this uh, method uh, was done. This was a non-GLP method. And therefore, uh, there was this much effect on, on the test. So there has to be that description so that uh, that uh, test, uh, because that test could determine the validity of a particular study. And so that description must be contained. And for the uh, bio uh, uh, biologics or the biopharmaceutical put, uh, products are different from the chemical products, as I said. And so that uh, the traditional uh, toxicology methods and uh, the uh, schedule cannot be applied. And before doing the uh, preclinical testing, you have to decide on the dosage, you have to decide on the animals uh, species. And, and so this is, uh, you have to do efficacy testing for that purpose. And biological activity, you can look at it in vivo or in vitro. And so, in vitro, to look at, when you're using in vitro uh, method, then you will have to look at the uh, cell assays in order to look at the binding affinity, or, or specifically, you may look at uh, cell proliferation or cell uh, survival uh, to do uh, the assessment. And um, and if uh, cell lines are used, that is in vitro. Uh, now, among all the cell lines, where well, you would have to, uh, they are quite useful in selecting the right uh, animal species if you do use the cell lines, excuse me. And uh, the results uh, from that uh, can be used uh, to a uh, set a dosage in vivo. And in vivo uh, studies, the, uh, the mode of action uh, could be uh, of confirmed. And so biological activity and the 
uh, and the dynamics with the farmer. And uh, so those sort of assessment and the data from that will have, uh, will explain, or will help with uh, explaining MOS and the dosage in terms of preclinical as well as a clinical uh, testing. And so all, uh, so all these uh, testing or all these preparations need to be done in a very controlled environment. And as I said, uh, animal species selection is one of the most important things to do in, in the uh, preclinical safety uh, testing. And for the biologics, uh, the species, you have to think about the specificity of the species as well as the tissues. And uh, standard uh, toxicology testing would not be followed in this case. And so what does that mean? I mean, here it says relevant species. What does that mean? And this is a pharmacologically active. So we have to choose a species that is a pharmacologically active as well as biologically active. And also should, uh, we should also choose the animals that are clinically meaningful. So with that animal a species, you do the testing. And that's the most important thing to do. And how do you know which is the right uh, species? Uh, you could look at, uh, you could do efficacy testing in vivo, or you could also do immune, uh, you could also look at uh, uh, tissues that have the best uh, binding effect, uh, or uh, you could look at, uh, you know, uh, what is uh, most uh, closer or similar to human tissues. And that's the way uh, you can decide on the animal uh, species. And so uh, one would be rodent and uh, the other would be non-rodent. Uh, You're supposed to choose two types. And if these are uh, a biological class that's uh, been, then has been uh, tested for a long time, then you could do it with just one animal as species. But Oh, excuse me, if this is a short-term study, then you could uh, do with two types of species. And so you, if there are no differences between the two species in the short-term test, you know, in terms of farm, uh, in, uh, then in the long-term study, you could do it with just one uh, species. And uh, so per product, there has to, I mean, it is possible to uh, to do the assess uh, to do uh, in approve the human toxicity or impact in humans with just one species, then you could just use a uh, one species. So it doesn't always have to be two species. But uh, there could be cases when you do not have the appropriate uh, animal species. In that case, you could think about the transgenic animals and the human receptor or uh, could have the human epitope uh, containing uh, animals and protein or other monoclonal uh, antibodies that I have uh, developed can be easily expressed, then uh, you could use that. And also homologous uh, protein could use be utilized. So human protein uh, does not respond to the animal proteins. So with the animal proteins, you would uh, so you would use a similar uh, protein in the animal to do the testing. But when you use uh, homologous uh, proteins, well, in the uh, toxicology test, you have to uh, test with the final products. But here you're using uh, animal derived protein. So this is an indirect testing. So it's you're not act exactly using final product. And so whether uh, to uh, can you really anticipate a side effect with uh, in humans uh, with this sort of uh, product? So, but uh, but in this is a case when we don't have a choice. This is a case when we are using these indirect case uh, examples. But personally, I've not really used indirect um, uh, cases, and we also use uh, disease models, and uh, there are a, a lot of anti-cancer. Uh, drugs are being uh, developed and so the nude muscles or the NSGs or the genograph model is made and so that so this is uh, an artificial uh, creation of animal models so to see if this drug would have a specific uh, cytotoxic uh, effect uh, would appear and these sort of uh, animals, when you do, for instance, a toxicology testing, you are supposed to do it with the general animals. 
so that you know uh, you can detect a potential a side effects. But if you do use a disease model, then we, you do have to consider the variations among animals. And so for a toxicologist point of view, this is quite difficult to do a toxicological evaluation. However, uh, the biologists uh, that are, are very human specific, they do not uh, work in uh, animals. And some do are quite skeptical about doing this sort of testing with animals. And so transgenic uh, animals or the disease models are used uh, more and more, and particularly for the oncology and for the rare uh, disease uh, products. So we uh, these sort of models are being developed to do the assessment. And about the number of uh, animals, well, uh, there's no uh, uh, a predefined number of animals to be used. And of course, both a female and male have to be used. But if you're going to look at very specific uh, genetic uh, disease within one uh, gender, or in, well, in that case, you're only looking at one specific sex or specific gender, well, Oh, you could do that, but I haven't personally seen such a case when you just have to focus on one specific uh, gender. But usually, in short term, particularly in short term uh, studies, you have to look at both a gender or both a sexes. Maybe in the longer term, uh, maybe a scientific with the scientifically uh, uh, based documentation, you could talk to the regulatory body uh, of about uh, the number and the gender of animals. And as for the administration, uh, the route and the frequency administration should mimic uh, the actual clinical use. And so you do, however, here, what you have to think about is that in case of the recombinant of uh, proteins, the clearance occurs very quickly. And so a uh, frequency interval may uh, have to be uh, narrower. So there has to be more of uh, administration. And so, uh, so the basic principle is that, uh, that we are supposed to mimic human uh, clinical trials, but in, uh, there are cases uh, because, of the, the, because the clearance occurs very quickly, then more uh, administration, more number of administration uh, could be uh, considered. And, and so, and when doing uh, the administration in terms of the concentration or the volume, what well, this are something that uh, special something that a special attention need to be paid, and a concentration is uh, fixed, and there are sometimes where it's difficult to uh, adjust them. When even doing the toxicity testing, you fix uh, the the volume, and then uh, you control uh, the concentration, but. Uh, and if it's a local size, well, uh, there are uh, limitations. But uh, the volume for the human administration, well, uh, uh, the uh, in the testing, uh, the volume has to be larger than human uh, administration. And what's more important is this. It's the, the, the dosage, how to decide on a dosage. NOAA-L is used and toxic those are used. So so sometimes uh, three uh, different dosages are used, but uh, what's really important is that there has to be a dose response of relationship. Not all three different types of dosage have to be used. Uh, what's important is that as long as you know that uh, toxic dose or the no RL that you can only do two dosage, but there are risks to this. And so if you, but in the development phase, you want to be as safe as possible and just be, and you try to save uh, in the development. And then uh, later on, uh, toxicity is not sufficiently uh, confirmed and uh, the recovery is not done uh, sufficiently, then that's going to be an issue. And also, just because there's no uh, toxicity does not mean you can you know, continue to increase uh, dosage. Uh, you have to have a scientific justification. 
you know, to say that uh, they have, can be, you know, several times more than human uh, exposure. In the addendum, where well, there's more uh, description about uh, dosage, if you could read uh, the addendum, it could be quite useful. And high dosage. And oh, we, we do have to think about the pharmacological effect. Of course, uh, you know uh, this already. And about uh, immunogenicity in the biologics, it's all immunogenic in animals. And when measuring, so you do have to measure antibodies and antibody response. Well, if that's, I mean, I mean it's, it's a neutralizing antibodies, then PK or the PD profile would be different. And then uh, AD must be uh, measured. And so uh, that is how you should uh, consider immunogenicity. And so just because there's an ADA, and so in case of neutralizing antibodies, there will be lower exposure, and uh, you may not be able to get the exposure that you need. Therefore, you may have to terminate the testing. However, uh, that is not an absolute uh, criteria. Sometimes, you know, over a long term, I mean, there could be a functionality that appear. There could be a con. Uh, there could be a continuous response. So uh, this is something that need to be considered. But this is not the only criteria to be considered. And in the animal testing, uh, ADA, it's not an indicator that's meaningful for human, but uh, in uh, rarely in humans. Uh, that uh, uh, antibodies are formed in people, and if they are of are formed, uh, you could still see a uh, continuous effectiveness. And so ADA need to be considered. And so the PK and PD uh, impacts and also uh, and the uh, toxicological indicators need to be looked at along uh, with the ADS. And then uh, about uh, safety of pharmacology. And this is something that you do have to think about when doing the toxicology testing, whether you're going to do this separately or if you're going to do in combination with other uh, types of testing. But uh, safety of volume, uh, the safety of pharmacology is to look at unanticipated uh, uh, pharmacology, safety pharmacology, because uh, pharmacology could have an impact on the cardiovascular, respiratory, and central nervous systems. And so with, with just one injection, of course, you could have multiple injections. It's mostly just one injection. And so depending on the purpose of the test, so for the pre, uh, so when you're doing the uh, uh, so the safety of pharmacology should be looked should be looked at along with uh, toxicology safety uh, assessment, and so when uh, designing on the study, you have to include a safety of pharmacology, and in case of cardiovascular, uh, in that case, how to say may not. Uh, not be uh, appropriate because they would not the in vitro, in vitro uh, hug or say would not be meaningful, and so that could be a uh, combined, and so you do have to design the overall assessment, but uh, you have to uh, make a decision based on the scientific data. So you could do it separately or you could do it in combination. So no, that I'm talking about the safety of pharmacology, and about uh, PK. You look at single uh, PK uh, profile, and then you do uh, multiple injections, and then look at the PK again to see uh, the uh, toxicological uh, uh, changes, and uh, that does provide very uh, useful information. However, if the PK profile is different among our uh, animals, then uh, it's not going to be easy to anticipate uh, the uh, side effects in humans. And so you have to look at those response of relationship and uh, it, if see if those uh, responses are enough to make uh, the assessment. But uh, uh, biologics have the immune-mediated uh, clearances, and therefore the, clear, uh, the profile may change and could impact uh, toxical kinetics. And uh, for when you're looking at PK or TK, what's really important is the assays or uh, ELISA. Uh, is used uh, for the uh, the tools and those uh, assay methodologies need to be validated 
if you if, even if you do the validation in house uh, or you do it uh, at a GLP uh, facility in a con then um, so even if what I'm trying to say is that in, even if you do uh, the in-house uh, ass assessment, you do have to do a validation in line uh, with the GLP uh, protocols. And sometimes uh, a separate or independent validation report is uh, required, not just in Korea, but also other countries. They sometimes ask for the validation report, so to keep that in mind. And uh, it's a protein and that is being uh, put in. And so it could be uh, binding to plasma. And so you do also have to uh, think about antibodies too. And about uh, metabolism, uh, it would be, within the body, this would be uh, degraded. And so, uh, so the biologics or the biological metrics, such as plasma and serum, you do have to understand uh, their behavior. And you also have to understand the relationship with the, uh, the binding on proteins to understand uh, how uh, PD effect will change. And so my previous uh, speaker talked about the toxicity uh, studies. Uh, so I'm just going to cover uh, the critical points here. In uh, single dose uh, toxicity uh, studies was a uh, mandatory in the past as a part of the GLP, but now uh, it's not uh, mandatory. You could do uh, the uh, the toxicity in house, but uh, if uh, but you have to do in the repeat dose testing in house if you're going to uh, in, if you're not going to do single dose uh, toxicity at uh, GLP. And so uh, you do need to keep this in mind as you conduct this uh, type of study. And safety of pharmacology, I said that it's going to be uh, as, it's going to be as, could be done separately. So you do have to think about that. And about repeated dose uh, toxicity uh, studies, uh, the dosing route uh, and the dosing uh, regimen uh, should reflect uh, the intended uh, clinical use and exposure. And the recovery uh, period should be included in the design, in the study design. If it's a three months a study, then there should be one month of recovery. But uh, for biologics, uh, there are uh, there are cases when the effects are shown in a delayed uh, manner. It's not exactly a side effect. It could be more an exaggerated pharmaco uh, pharmacological effect. And so, if the recovery period is uh, is too short, then uh, you know uh, not sufficient recovery could take place. So, if the, there is going to be three months of administration, the recovery period should be uh, three months. So, compared to the chemical products, uh, the recovery period is longer. There has to be a full uh, recovery. It's not full recovery that we are aiming at. What's really important is where there is a reversibility. So if there is a recovery, uh, it's okay. It, may, it doesn't have. To, there does not have to be a complete return to uh, to normalcy. So this has to be uh, considered uh, when uh, designing the study. And as for the immunotoxicity studies, and biologists do uh, stimulate uh, immune system and bring about the inhibition. And so they uh, they not only uh, the humoral. Uh, but also cell-mediated immunity uh, could be uh, affected. And uh, today we'll talk mainly about the antibodies, but uh, there could be immune cell uh, proliferation or others. And so uh, you have to think about uh, cytokine and effects and others as part of the assessment tools. So what I'm saying is that you could have a separate uh, uh, immunotoxicity testing, and but you do have to do uh, tissue and uh, blood-related uh, testing to be able to uh, measure uh, in order to have more accurate uh, testing. And uh, so biologics, whether it's uh, sub-Q or other, uh, I mean, 
if there is going to be a, a administration, there's going to be a local inflammation, then uh, you have to know the causes. Is it because of the vehicle or is it because of the uh, the stimul this, uh, a stimulus to the epithelia of the cells? Or it could, is it because of the antibodies that have bound to uh, the uh, tissue and bringing about uh, this sort of a response. So that assessment has to be done. And, and per a uh, product, uh, you would have a different approach when it comes to uh, reproductive uh, studies. And there has to be a, a specific design. Uh, you have to think about the immunogenicity, you have to think about the biological activity and the animal as species. For the gene uh, genotoxicity study, we do not do the study a lot, but there are some cases where the a linker is bound to the protein, and it can be some cleavage later on. So that kind of the uh, thing need to be studied, but it's not a general study. So in vitro, in vivo models may be needed. For carcinogenicity, it's not done a lot in the past. Parathyroid hormone was developed by one company, by a certain company. It took a long uh, time ago, and we considered whether we go for the carcinogenicity or not. However, the protein was the main uh, substance, so the risk was low. So usually the carcinogenicity study is not done enough. However, still, if there are the reason for concern, then the alternative measures or the lot of measures can be taken to conduct the carcinogenicity study. For the local tolerance study, for the injected site, whether there is a stimulation or not. So for this local tolerance study, focus on the injected area. So single dose or the repeat dose study actually include this portion by looking at the, the histo uh, histopathological examination. And addendum six. I want to talk about it as the six addendum. The addendum is to cover the remaining details, which is not covered by the body of the S6 because this area is changing quite fast. And the initial publication, since the initial publication of the S6, there have been a lot of changes and development to reproduce animal species. So all these things are covered in the addendum. So. The guidance facilitate the timely uh, conduct of the clinical trials and also the use, reduce the use of the animals in line with the three R's. Well, I have been involved in the toxic, uh, toxicity testing for quite years. I think as I see some changes from the FDA, like 15 animals or 20 animals per group no matter what. But this is not the approach at this moment. Rather, the appropriate number of the animals is required for a study. So 3R as a principle is upheld by many regulatory bodies. And actually the, uh, the compliance with the 3R principle is, can be a evidence that the applicant is following the trend. And for the animal species, you need to use the uh, relevant animal species. Depending on the species, homology, the target specific homology need to be considered in in vitro assay need to be done to look at the binding affinity and also the receptor occupancy. So by doing so, you can select the appropriate animal study and functional activity in vivo is also need to be assessed. So TCR is new one. For the monoclonal antibody, the lot of human panels the immunochemistry bindings shows that where the antigen and antibody are bound. And of course, this is usually from the human, but uh, from the animal, uh, the TCR study can be used in order to select the species. And whether we go for one or two species, basically two species in the long term, two species mandatory for the long term, we can go for one species. And if the toxicological findings are similar, then for the long-term study, we can go for one species. So it's not like no matter what two species, the mode has been changed from two species to one species, depending on the situation. For the homologous protein, 
if there is no other alternative, then homologous protein can be considered as an alternative approach. However, as I said before, the homologous protein is not the final product, and therefore, it can be used to detect hazard. It's not like a quantitative risk assessment. So identification of the hazard would be the purpose of using the homologous protein. And for the dose selection, those response relationship needs to be considered in selecting dose. PKPD approach, which is not in the S6, are delineated in, uh, in the addendum. The maximum pharmacological effect, the dose that shows that, can be decided as the hu high dose. And considering human exposure in animal, about tenfold exposure, multiple over the maximum exposure to be achieved in the clinic. In the past, the focus only was on the like kilogram, the body weight. But here, the safety margin can be sufficiently uh, acquired or attained with the tenfold exposure uh, multiple. So the higher of these two doses should be chosen for the high dose group. And PDPK data need to be considered in deciding the dose and binding affinity in vitro pharmacological activities. If there are some changes or the differences, then there should be some adjustment. So biological activity or the efficacy study and other things need to be considered in a holistic manner. There is no correction index, so you need to uh, select the correction factors based on your situation. For the duration of the study, it's not exceeding six months. Usually we see one to three month study, and I do not see many cases where the duration exceeds a six month. For the recovery, at least one species, one dose level, need to be observed for the recovery. And it is important to make it sure whether there is a reversibility or not. For bioproducts, there can be delayed toxicity. So the recovery, the full recovery to the normal condition is not required. And considering immunogenicity, the addition of the recovery peri period just to assess the potential for immunogenicity is not required. And for the immunogenicity, the addendum says that the immunogenicity in human can be expected, but it's not a requirement. So measurement of ADA in non-clinical studies, there are three cases where that should be evaluated, like the evidence of the altered PD activity, or in the absence of a PD marker, we have the unexpected change in exposure or immune-related reaction. So if these are the cases, then the ADA is measured. So the, in a serial manner, we collect the blood and store it, and then if we have some altered profile, and then we measure ADA. So of course, we can do the preliminary study to check this point because it's not easy to establish the analytical method. So you need to consider this kind of a possibility during the study. And if the ADA is detected, the, you need to think about what kind of impact it has on the overall data or the interpretation. If you have the in neutral antibody, then and, and you don't have the appropriate markers, then ADA is needed to be characterized for the reproductive and development toxicity, actually there are many addition in the addendum on this. S5 deals with the reproductive uh, toxicity, but this addendum provides more details like the selection of the relevant animals, rodent and rabbit. When the clinical candidate is pharmacologically active in rodent and the rabbit, then both the species should be used for the EFD studies. Well, there are not many cases of the reproductive toxicities testing on the biologics. NHP, like the monkeys, can be used in the study to check the fertility. But it's not like a full reproductive study or the development toxicity that there has no, there has been no study of such. But the details, the relevant details are added in the addendum. So as for the fertility study, the pharmacologically relevant animal need to be selected and the study design, consider immunogenicity and the characteristics of the substance. 
for NHP, the development of toxicity studies should be only conducted in NHP if they are only relevant uh, species. And the timing of study for the reproductive uh, toxicity study, embryo fetal or the postnatal study are usually for the phase three. You can just read the slide for the remaining details. For the carcinogenicity, I said that, that uh, the carcinogenicity testing is not done a lot, but depending on the product, let's say there is a potential for the proliferation or it can stimulate other tissues. If there is such concern, then you can consider the carcinogenicity study. But in practice, I do not see many carcinogenicity studies done. There is a case study, but because of the time constraint, I will skip the case study. So with that, I'd like to close my presentation.